So welcome back. Uh, we're ready to look at module two of this course on designing solutions for uh, SQL Server databases. And what we're going to look at in this module is designing database security. So uh, Christian, fairly important topic, I think. Absolutely. Uh, why don't you tell us what we're going to cover in this module? So in terms of designing database security, we're going to start off having an introduction to SQL Server security just to really establish uh, the basics. Then we're going to have a look at some details around managing server level security and then database um, level security and database level principles, managing database permissions themselves, and then finally we'll end talking about some encryption methods and different scenarios that, that SQL Server can, can support. So it's reasonably comprehensive coverage of all the different things you might need to think about in terms of designing security. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, let's let's crack on and give us a, an overview of SQL Server security. So, so fundamental for the SQL Server security that you need to understand, first of all, is this idea of a securable. So a securable is an object to which access must be secured. Then we have principles, and principles are security identities that access securables to perform actions. And then finally, a uh, final piece of the puzzle are the permissions themselves, so the actions that principles can perform against the securable. Okay, so that's, that's fairly straightforward in, in an abstract sense, and of course that's, that's pretty much true of any uh, securable system, that you have things you want to control access to, people who want to access them, yeah. and what allows you to access them is, is having permission. Yeah? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So, so this next slide here is really talking about all of the, the possible securables within SQL Server. So we have the scope, first of all, of the SQL Server instance level. We have server level objects. We have databases, database level objects, down to schema, and then objects within schemas themselves. So there's a distinct hierarchy then, starting from the, well, we say server, we mean the SQL Server instance. Correct, and of course, on, yeah. on a computer server, there could be multiple instances. Yeah. So at the instance level, there's things that we want to ac control access to, the server itself, and then server level objects, and then the same through databases into schemas, right down to tables and views, and actually, in some cases, right down to individual columns within Absolutely, tables. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and this next slide, it looks very complicated, uh, but is really an overview of the SQL Server principles. Um, on the left-hand side in blue, we have Windows. So first of all, Windows users, which can be part of um, Active Directory global groups. Uh, <coughs> and then we would use um, Windows local groups within the domain to apply permissions. And on the right-hand side, we've got SQL Server instance level. So we have Windows users and Windows groups that will map into um, logins within SQL Server um, and then connect through to database users um, within the databases themselves. So it's, it's probably worth talking through the, this kind of chain of connections then. I, I think uh, uh, starting on the left-hand side, I guess, on the left-hand side we've got uh, all the things that are managed by Windows. So these, these aren't, yeah. this isn't a hierarchy that exists within SQL Server. This is true of any uh, Windows environment um, and quite often um, when you're designing security for a Windows environment for things like printers and file servers and, and that type of thing, we have this principle where we take users within the domain, so individual users who will log on with their username and password, we put them into global groups which exist across the, the whole domain or perhaps within a particular organization, organizational unit of the domain, but we have these, these global groups that exist throughout the entire um, environment but then the way that Windows works, we always talk about putting users into global, global into local, local then gets access to exactly, resources. Yeah. So we have this, this double level grouping. And the, the local groups, they could be groups that are defined on a server. You know, a, a, a member server of a domain has this concept of groups that exist locally on that server. And we can put global groups from the domain into those local groups. But there is also this concept within a, an Active Directory domain of a domain local group, which seems a little counterintuitive, but it's the same idea. The idea is to have a way of having global groups that um, group users with common sort of um, organizational roles together, but then having local groups that represent different resources that we want to control access to. So that's, that's a, a concept you may find if you're a DBA uh, within a, a Windows environment, the Windows administrator may already be enforcing this type of hierarchy where users go into global groups, global groups go into local groups, and local groups are what we give access to uh, in terms of permissions. And in, in, in the 
the Windows administrator's world, that's things like file servers and printers. Yeah. Bringing that then into SQL Server, we can look at this from the point of view of saying, well, one of the things we might want to give these, these local um, Windows groups access to is SQL Server. And the way we do that is we create a login that is a Windows login within SQL Server. So that, that Windows login, sometimes it's actually a Windows user, an individual user that's assigned to that login because we bypass this, this hierarchy that the, the, uh, the Windows administrator might use. But sometimes it might be a Windows local group that's, that's mapped to a, a, a Windows login in SQL Server. SQL Server then has its own um, security infrastructure as well. So in parallel with that, we have these SQL Server logins, which have nothing to do with Windows whatsoever. This is us saying we're going to, you know, we're not really worried about anything to do with the Windows environment. We're simply creating a, a login here that has a, a username and password typically to access the server. Then we have a similar kind of hierarchy to what we see in Windows. Within SQL Server itself, we put our logins, think of those as being almost kind of global users within the, the SQL Server system. We put those into server roles when we want to give them access to server level resources. But if we want to give them access to an individual database, we need a database user within that database that's mapped to the login. And then that database user can be put into a database role within that database and permissions can be assigned to the database role. So it's all about um, grouping principles with similar resource requirements together and then assigning the permissions to those, those groupings. That's yeah, usually exactly. the way you want to do it. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, having kind of got our heads around the, the, the somewhat complex architecture with these, <laughs> these two world views, um, let's uh, kind of dig into this and look at permissions, how we go about assigning permissions. Yeah, sure. So, so the first thing that, that you need to understand, certainly for the context of the exam um, and your kind of everyday use of SQL Server, um, is this idea of a grant. So when we uh, grant, we use a grant to assign permissions, um, and permissions are cumulative unless they're denied. And the key thing to remember for this is a deny is an explicit deny uh, and overrides um, all of your grants, to, whether you get them from groups or you have been explicitly uh, granted access to a, to a securable. So even if I'm in, uh, let's say I've, I've logged in, I'm in a database, so I'm at, the at this level I'm a database user, and that database user is inside a database role as well. So I've got, I've got membership of the, I, I don't know, um, payment clerk's um, database role, and that role has permission to select from a table. If my individual user account is denied permission, even although I'm in a, gr a group, a, a, a database role that has permission, the deny will override that grant. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and we can use revoke to remove a grant or a deny. So a deny is you're not allowed access to this, um, and we would use revoke to revoke a deny, if that makes sense, okay. or to revoke a grant. All right, that makes sense. So in terms of, of server-level security, what I wanted to talk about here is a couple of um, different security models. And this first one here is what we call a trusted server application model, where the user accesses an application, and then the application uses its own credentials to authenticate and access SQL Server. So this is a traditional kind of application model for SQL Server, but it also presents a number of challenges in terms of um, accountability and um, being able to granularly assign permissions to specific users against SQL Server. Because what we can't do with this model is on SQL Server to say, I want this user to have this specific, specific set of permissions because all of the users are coming into the application and then the application has its own set of credentials there. And of course, there's a, a compliance consideration there as well. If, if for uh, whatever reason in your industry you have to audit access to data. Well, exactly. in this model, you're going to audit that the application was used to access data, but you may not be auditing the individual user. You'd have to actually do that at the application level. Exactly. And it's a very common requirement. Um, and it, it, it's what um, historically was called a double hop problem. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. heard that term before. Mm -hmm. um, because you're having to hop to the application and then hop to SQL Server. Um, and the technology that we would use to, um, to get around that problem 
is what we call this impersonation and delegation security model. Um, it's quite a significant domain, so there isn't a lot of detail that we're going to go into in the context of this course. Um, but to follow up on this, um, it's the Kerberos authentication mm. is, is what we're talking about. So it's at the Active Directory level. And we have this um, impersonation and delegation model. So the application and the server application is then um, has the authority to impersonate a specific user going to SQL Server. So you can have that um, auditing and you can have that accountability right the way through from the user and their own login uh, being passed through to SQL Server. So a, a good example of this might be something like SharePoint Server where you uh, log into the SharePoint Server as an, an individual Windows user. SharePoint may then access resources on your behalf. It might go to um, SQL Server reporting services, for exactly. example, but it will do it using your credentials, not its own credentials. So that, that identity is propagated all the way through and the permissions that are applied apply to the individual user, not to SharePoint as an application. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And for the, the, for the purposes of the exam, um, you need to, to relate this impersonation delegation security model to, to Kerberos. And to, to have a look at some further reading on that, uh, it's definitely worth doing. Mm. All right, so um, what about how, how does the SQL Server authenticate the connections that are coming in there? So we're, there are two methods that we can authenticate. So the first one we have there is Windows authentication. So that on a default installation of SQL Server, this is the only way that you can um, authenticate with SQL Server. So this is where your Windows, uh, whether it's a domain account or a local Windows account, has been mapped into SQL Server and a SQL Server the wrong word to say login, but this Windows user has been mapped to um, a principal within SQL Server and then permissions are applied to that. Okay. So the idea behind that is that SQL Server will go to Active Directory in the domain or the local security, um, the, secu um, the Windows authentication, so you don't need to re-authenticate so, so um, SQL Server itself doesn't actually authenticate. It, it trusts Windows to have authenticated exactly, this user. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But there needs to be um, some connectivity and access to the domain. So there was an example we talked about on a previous course around preemptive wait types and, mm. and authentication issues. So when you, as a user, connect into SQL Server as a Windows user in a domain, um, SQL Server will then need to go to the domain to enumerate the, the Windows groups that you're a member of to have a look at what you can have access to. So you need that connectivity element to, to a domain. Okay, so that's fine. What, what if I don't want to use Windows authentication? What if I just want to use a username and password? So then you would uh, you would switch to mixed authentication, so uh, which enables you to either be authenticated by Windows or to be authenticated authenticated by SQL Server itself. So we can create, define, and manage logins directly in SQL Server. And we can even, um, in later versions of SQL Server, you can uh, provide a lot more manageability around those local logins where um, authentication is encrypted by default. So there was mm -hmm. older versions of SQL Server. We would avoid this because of clear text passwords. Mm -hmm. So now the uh, authentication process is encrypted. We can hook our Active Directory password policy straight into SQL Server. So we can have the same... Um, password complexity requirements for SQL Server logins as we have for the domain. The expiry and, and all that kind of thing. Exactly, thing. exactly. So it, it's far more manageable uh, as, a, as a, an authentication mode um, today than, than it has been historically. But the preference and the, the nirvana, if you like, is mm -hmm. for everything to be based on Windows authentication. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very often uh, not possible to do that. So a lot of environments would be uh, have a mixed authentication, have mixed model. authentication. Yeah. and ju just to be absolutely clear there is no option to say i only want sql server authentication Correct. not windows yeah okay yeah. all right great well that, that's the authentication options then so once i've been authenticated i've i've um, connected to sql server either using my windows um, credentials or by providing sql server login credentials i've been authenticated there 
what can I do at the server level? How do we manage permissions so, there? So we have this, this idea of um, server level roles. So you have this, like you say, you have this authentication into SQL Server, and then you have the, the uh, opportunity then to be added to server level roles. So this is um, a grouping of a number of um, server level uh, permissions that you could have. So a uh, very uh, commonly known one would be sysadmin. So this is the, the super user group mm -hmm. that would give you permissions to everything. Um, we have an example on the slide around uh, the public server role. So every login is a member of the public server role and that allows um, uh, logins to SQL Server to be able to enumerate the databases, and that's something that you can you can disable. Right. And quite often in high secure environments, you disable that public server role because we don't want people to see what databases that are on there exactly. when they connect through an application. We just connect them to the database they need to connect to. And yeah, so it. I mean, it's it's fine for general purpose use. It, it's not like it's a security hole mm. that that Microsoft haven't fixed. Um, but it's certainly there and you can disable it uh, by default. So we would okay. use these fixed server roles to assign, uh, to delegate administrative tasks and groupings of permissions. But we can also, which is quite recent, um, you can create user-defined server roles. So if the fixed server roles don't you need it. And moving forward with the product, it will head more towards creating these user-defined server roles for exactly what you need, rather than having this broad spread permissions in a, in a general group. So we can think of the fixed server roles as being, these are built in um, groupings of, of that you can place your, your logins into that already have pre-assigned permissions to do commonly required things. But if you want to delegate a subset of, of responsibilities, you, you perhaps, because uh, we're thinking at the server level, most of these things are kind of operational type tasks. These, yes. This isn't access to yeah. data. This is more about um, accessing attributes of the server itself. Um, I'm, I might want to, let's say, for example, um, uh, well, we're going to see an example in a little while. You're going to show mm -hmm. us an example where I might want a tester to be able to, to do certain things at the server level, but not to actually have full admin rights across the whole system. Yeah, yeah. exactly. exactly. Okay. Well, speaking of which, let's, uh, let's actually see that. Okay, so I'm... Okay, so I'm connected sorry, to. I was just cuff it there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm connected to my server. Um, I'm in Object Explorer here, and I can see my security. So I've got my server level logins here. Um, I can expand my server roles. So let's just have a look at what we have here. So we have a number of fixed server roles that we've just mentioned. So sysadmin, we talked a little bit about um, as being this super user. Um, and you really need to be qu quite careful who and the number of accounts that, that you put in sysadmin. Because it's a super user, you can't deny sysadmin from anything. So whenever uh, SQL Server is evaluating permissions, there's an if sysadmin skip the, the, mm. the check. So you can't block sysadmin from anything. So you really need to be very careful um, about the accounts that, that you give that privilege to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that we could also create these uh, user-defined server roles. So if I right-click server roles here and do new server role, let's create um, testers is a good one that you just mentioned. So let's create a server role called testers. And <clears throat> we want to assign permissions. So Coeo Lab CX is my local server. And let's say we want um, anyone that's a member of the testers fixed server role. We want them to be able to um, impersonate any login. So we'll grant them the permission to impersonate any login. So now we have this testers group. So we've we've now got. Um, it, it's interesting. You 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 call it a group there, and I always refer to them as groups as well. The technical name is roles, but you yes. can think of them if you're more comfortable in the, the Windows world where we talk about groups. It's the same idea. It's yeah, it's an object. A it's a container object that has permissions into which we can put individual principles. Mm. So let's just. Um, I don't have any logins here. So let's just create uh, a new login called. Tester. I'll give him a password. <clears throat> 
And at this point, I could assign them to the server role. So we've got this testers mm -hmm. user-defined server role here. Um, but let's just create that. You may not have typed the password correctly. <laughs> There we go. So I have this tester user, and I can go to testers, and I can add tester as a member of this role. So now somebody logging in with this login is automatically going to have <coughs> the uh, the permissions to impersonate another login. Okay. So if, if if we okay on that, can we now go back to that individual login there? You got tester and bring that guy up. Uh, just just a little tip for, for those of you who are managing this. One of the things you can then do here is if you go to securables at that point, we can actually see what permissions um, th that um, that user has. And you'll see on this explicit tab that there's nothing typed. There's no explicit permission applied to that individual user. Um, but if other than connect equal, whichever user would get because they're they're connecting. But if, if we switch across to effective, they've also got the impersonate any login, which they're inheriting because they're a member of that server level role. That's so that this, this idea of inheritance, you inherit in two ways. You inherit permissions either because there's a hierarchy of securables. So if you have permission to execute on a schema, for example, mm. that means you have permission to execute all the store procedures within that schema. So permission is inherited that way. But it's also inherited by dint of being a member of uh, a, a, either a role or a grouping or, or some other thing. So there's there's multiple ways that permissions can be inherited. Yeah. Yeah. Good tip. Right. Should we switch back to the yeah, slides? Yeah. Let's go back to the slides. And let's move on from looking at our server level um, security, which we, we've done, to looking at individual databases. So I've, I've got a server that will have one or more databases in there. We'll have the system databases and, and presumably some user databases as well. So what do we do there? We're going to look at database users first. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so we, we authenticate against the server. But we don't use that server level login to access database resources. We have to map directly into a database user. Now, normally, we would <coughs> automatically create um, a database user that's the same name as the login. So it can be very easy for you not to come across this concept mm. if you've been using SQL Server for a while uh, because it doesn't look any different. But they are, in fact, two uh, very distinct uh, principles, and they don't have to be the same name. But you need to map into a database user um, every time you want to access a database. So I could have a, a, a login at the server level. I've got a mapped database user at one of the databases on theirs level. But there could be other databases in which I don't have a user account exactly. and I don't have access to those, regardless of the fact that I've got a server level login. Exactly. So effectively, what we're doing, if we wanted to, if I wanted to give you access to a database, you already had a login and you had access to another database, what would happen is that a new database user would be created that was mapped to your server level login. Okay. So there's a, a couple of, of users. I've noticed when I created a database, there's a couple of users already in there. So tell me a little bit about that. So we have uh, DBO, so Database Owner, that stands for. And, and we talked a little bit about this in the last course, didn't we, about mm -hmm. the, the legacy around this DBO um, user. Um, so DBO is, you can think of it the equivalent of sysadmin or, or the, the SA account for a database. And... Um, uh, so the SA login will map into DBO. Anybody that's a member of sysadmin, it's really this kind of default schema will come through this this database, uh, this DBO database user. Okay. And what about guest access then? So so guest, there's a there's a, a database user called guest that's disabled by default in user databases, and it's really um, what we're enabling with this is to say, I want everybody to be able to connect to this database, even if they don't have explicit permissions to do this, but we've, it's disabled by default. And, and that's probably a sensible default in Absolutely. most cases. You're not going to allow guests Absolutely. access. Yeah. Okay. 
So we, we talked about DBO, database owner there, and mm. I guess database ownership as a, as a concept is something we probably ought to address. Let's, let's yeah, talk about absolutely. That. So, so as it says on the slide there, so like other objects, databases have owners, and the database owner will default to the user that created it, which can cause no end of, of troubles actually in production environments and, and out in the field. Because when you create a database, so if somebody says I need a database on this server, you create it, it gets created in the context of your user. And over time people move on in different roles and uh, what you can often find is that the database owner is a Windows domain account and it's for somebody that's left the business and over time, three months later, uh, the Windows team will remove their login from Active Directory, which means that the user that owns that database doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that can cause all sorts of functionality uh, problems when you're trying to access the database. So in, in general, you probably want to leave things as they are by default, where a, a database is owned by the DBO user, which is typically mapped to the SA in, in, in uh, a default situation. Yeah, so so we uh, it's one of the things that we would check for in a health check is to make sure that all the databases were owned by. It doesn't have to necessarily be owned by by SA, so it needs mm -hmm. to be a server level login, uh, but it needs to be an account or a group that isn't related to an individual person because people move on from right. from, from different roles. Okay, that makes sense. So within that database, we talked about database users, and we've talked a little bit about the, the owner of the database. I, and we talked at the server level about logins and server level roles, and it's kind of mirrored at the database level, right? Exactly. There, there's database users and database roles. Yeah, exactly. So we would assign users to fixed database roles, database level roles, the same that we talked about with the, um, the, the server level roles to, to grant common permissions. And we have a number of, of uh, default database roles there, data readers, data writers. So I just want somebody to have read access to this database mm. so I can just add them as a member of, of data reader. And we can also, like we can at server level, we can create user-defined um, database roles to add users to. Right. So again, all th these roles are, I, think about it from a design perspective. If you're designing the security of a database, you don't want to be granting hundreds of permissions and having to maintain them. So you're, you're trying as much as possible not to be granting permissions to individual users or individual logins. Absolutely. You want to group principles with similar access requirements together, in this case at the database level in a database role, and then use permissions applied to that role to apply to everybody who's in that role. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I guess the, the other thing I did want to kind of call out here is, as well as the, uh, the DB data reader and DB data writer roles that you talked about, which would give access to... Uh, read or read and write access to all of the tables and, and uh, views in the database, there's a deny data reader and deny data writer rule as well. And remember, a deny overrides a grant. So regardless of any other permissions the individual user might have, either directly or by membership of any other rules, mm. if a user is a member of deny data writer, they can't write to any of the databases. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be very common to add a user to... Um, data reader and deny data writer explicitly yeah. um, just to ensure that there isn't kind of any inherited permissions exactly. to provide that. The thing about inheritance is it, it, it's, it's great for reducing the number of individual permissions that you have to grant and manage, but it does make it very difficult to track well, what's the effective permission for this principle? Yes. What are they inherited through either role membership or through a hierarchy of yeah, securables? Exactly. Okay. So th there's another type of role. We talked about database roles, which is something we put database users into in order mm. to group them together with similar access requirements. There is another type of role, and that's an application role. So t tell us a little bit about yeah. that. So application roles are, are, are really quite a useful concept. Um, so essentially, it allows you to switch the security context. So you think of an example scenario where you're connecting to, or your users connect to SQL Server through your application, and you give them a login, you give them a SQL Server login, and it has all the permissions that, that they need to, to work within their application. There's nothing to prevent them using Excel or SQL Server Management Studio to connect to SQL Server directly mm. because you're not restricting how they can connect. 
Mm. So where, what we would use application roles for is to say um, within the application, I will then switch security context to uh, to have higher permissions. So this isn't seen by the user and it's not something that a user would control directly, but it enables uh, it would enable us to provide a greater level of permissions only through the application rather than providing the user with a with a direct login. Okay. One, one of the examples I've, I've sometimes seen is, is even within the one application, switching the role to get elevated privileges. Exactly. The same way as you would in Windows, perhaps, if you try and do something, if you, anybody who's been logged in as the administrator on, on a Windows box ever since Windows XP actually knows that when you try and do something that requires admin level privileges, it prompts you to elevate your permissions. Yeah. So you could take a similar uh, approach here. You could, for example, have um, checkouts in a supermarket where each individual checkout operator is logged in using their own identity because we want to audit you know, who's, who's actually accessing cash at the till. Mm -hmm. But as they put through your, your groceries and you change your mind about something that's more expensive than I thought it was, I need you to void that out. Well, that individual checkout operator probably doesn't have permission to void out a sale, but a supervisor could come along and elevate the per permissions temporarily, in this case by activating an application yeah. role that does have permission, void out the sale by deleting the role from the table, and then revert back to the permissions that the, uh, the checkout operator has, which doesn't have delete permission, and then carry on working. So it's, yeah, it's a good way of switching to a different level of permissions for a specific task. Yeah, great. Okay, so you're going to show us how that works, actually. actually. Let's, let's look that. at that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to have a look at my current security context. So we can see that um, I'm authenticated against the server with the Windows local Windows Administrator account and the database identity of DBO. And you're in the, you're in the people database at the moment, so your, your system level identity is... You have to be logged in as the administrator, exactly, yeah. and that is mapped to the DBO user in this database. Okay, exactly. So, uh, so now I'm going to um, set app role. So I have a, a pre-configured application role called Pay Admin, with the password uh, in context there. Um, and while I'm running as as uh, Pay Admin under this application role, I'm going to select the security context there, um, and then disconnect. So you can see where that was running. My identity at that time was pay admin. So we could wrap some code within there to do something in the context of a pay admin um, application role that we've given a specific set of permissions to. So you, you've, you've flipped the identity f within this session to that database rather than now being DBO, you are pay admin. Notice that it's still identifies your system identity. So auditing yes. will still audit anything you do, even though you're using a different security context, auditing Absolutely. still records the Windows user who, who ultimately is, is doing this. But uh, what you've done is provided the, the password that goes with the, the admin role, the, uh, the application role that we define yeah. has a password. And uh, the create cookie uh, variable there, um, it, it's optional, but what it lets you do is, is revert back, you can deactivate the application role. If you don't use the cookie, and this is something worth, worth bearing in mind, if you don't use the cookie, you've no way of then going back to being the user you were to begin with. Yeah, the only way to do that would be to close the session and reconnect. Yeah, yep. great point. So then if we have a look again at the uh, security context, so I'm back running as, as DBO again. Great. So for, for that period, if we had, in this case, it's a pay admin, perhaps it's someone running the payroll at a, a business and, and we come across an anomaly where actually we need to apply a pay rise to this person. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we could get a supervisor to come over, provide the password that lets us activate the application role, elevate the permissions, do what we need to do, and then we can sign out. Absolutely. But what's going to be logged in the audit trail is still going to be the user who was actually connected at the time. Oh, the it's, login. Yeah, the login. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we've, we've seen how we can control the identities, if you like, of, of our, our users at the database level. We create users that map to logins, and we can switch the, uh, the, the identity, switch the security context by using application roles. But assuming we're not doing that, assuming we've got a, a, a user who's in that, that database, we've maybe added that user to a few uh, fixed database roles, maybe we've created some custom database roles of our own, 
how do we go about then applying permissions to roles and users that we might have defined in the database? Yeah, so, so we have a couple of examples here where uh, we're granting a create table to, to dbdev. Um, so we're using these statement permissions to govern data definition language and also object permissions that we have um, at, at the bottom there as well. So one of the most powerful things actually is around um, granting select uh, permissions and also denying select. So we can provide users with the permissions to be able to read data or deny them read data to specific objects, tables and views and things like that. Sure. And I, I guess similarly, uh, if we're using store procedures to do that reading and writing, it's the same idea, but it's execute permission on the store procedure rather than... Exactly. Right. Exactly. A okay. couple, couple of things just to note in the, the syntax. If it's a statement permission, then the syntax is grant and then the permission, so create table in the first instance, mm -hmm. to, and then the securables, uh, sorry, then the principles, in this case, uh, dbdev, which we're assuming is a, a database level role. Um, but you could bundle permissions together, so you've got grant, alter any role, and alter any user. So you don't have to do individual grant statements for yeah. each permission you want to grant. Um, at the object level, the syntax is similar, but it's grant, permission, um, to the the the, the uh, securable you want to um, grant it to, so it's grant whatever to in, in the case of the um, the alter application role. But if there's an object involved, if it's something like a table or a schema, the syntax becomes grant the permission on the object to the securable. So there's that extra on clause, if you like, for yeah. uh, for object level permissions. So. Let's get into objects. Let's talk specifically about tables and views because I guess those are the most common uh, things we'd want to grant yeah. permissions on. So, so the permissions that you can um, you can provide permissions for on tables and views are around select, insert, update, delete, and and uh, also references. So we can also have column level permissions. So I mentioned in the previous example one of the uh, the, the areas that we use this um, quite often actually is around providing. Um, access to select data or denying select from specific tables that maybe have a higher level of security and sensitivity than, than other tables. So we can create database roles that have um, a very fine granular level of permissions to the underlying data as well as the the, um, the, the schema as well. Mm. And, and the column level permissions, I'm, I'm guessing for example you might have something like a payroll table and yeah, absolutely, my payroll clerk can see people's names and the, their bank details because they need that to transfer the money. Mm. But I might actually not want to give them permission on the salary column, for exactly. example, but I might give that permission to an application role. So, yeah. you, you know, you, you, could, you could use those kind of column level permissions to get that fine grain. Mm. So, um, w at the moment, we've, we've kind of assumed we're granting permissions on individual objects, but of course, SQL Server is, is quite hierarchical. Objects can depend on other objects. Views can depend on tables. Store procedures can depend on views, which then depend on tables. So, so how does that work when there are permissions at multiple levels in the chain? So this is a really good, um, uh, it's a really good point, and it's certainly something that um, is, is firmly part of the exam domain, this idea of ownership chaining. It's based on this idea where <coughs> dependent objects are, are owned by the same user, uh, permissions at the top level are required. So if we build out uh, mm -hmm. this diagram here, so we have a user uh, and this user um, wants to access a view that's, been, that's owned by user two. Okay. But part of that definition, um, uh, part of the definition of view one um, is uh, accessing table one. Okay. And uh, this user will have access to be able to view that view and the data within that view because the owner of the view um, also owns the table. So there's, I can see there's a padlock on, on uh, the view. There's no padlock on the table because actually nothing's checked after we've checked the view because everything after that is owned by the same user. No further checks are required. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So we haven't broken the ownership chain. Okay. So if we try and access another resource now, so view two, that's also owned by user two. Okay. Um, so there's but, a permission check. Then. Yeah, so there's a permission check. and uh, But the definition of this view accesses a table uh, which is owned by user three. 
Now, user two may have permissions to access that table because, in fact, they probably do to create the, the mm -hmm. view in the first place. But because user three owns table two, uh, we've broken the ownership chain. So we're going to have to check to see if user one has permissions on, on uh, table two in order to view data through view two. And in this case, they don't. So we can see that the line stops there because user three hasn't granted any permissions yeah, and to user one. there's a padlock one. there if, you, if we... Yeah, uh, yeah. so there's a permission there, but there's no... There's a, a check for permissions, but there's no, no permissions granted. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that, that kind of makes sense. I, I guess in this case, you're trusting uh, if someone owns multiple objects and they, they have dependencies, if they grant permission on the first one, you kind of assume they know what they're doing and they know that that yeah. implies permission to everything underneath. But if the owner is different, then um, you, you probably... Um, it seems logical then that the owner would, would be the one to grant the permission. Yeah. Totally different subject now. We, we've kind of exhausted permissions, all the kind of regular access to data type yeah. stuff in terms of, of, of accessing uh, tables and so on. Um, but one of the main concerns that people will have with, with data is how do I protect that data at rest? It's all very well, you know, granting permissions for, for applications and users to go and read and write the data in the database. But that data is stored physically on a disk. How, how, do, I, how do I manage to, to make sure that even if they can read it, that you know, it, it's protected? Yeah, so, so this is where the transparent database encryption feature comes in, or TDE for short. <clears throat> and in order to, to set up transparent database encryption, we need to go through this security hierarchy around certificates and keys. So we have a service master key, which is created during uh, SQL Server installation. Mm -hmm. um, and then based on that, or not based on it, we then create a database master key uh, for the master database, but we'll use the service master key to uh, encrypt that database master key. So we start to get this hierarchy of protection which starts with this service master key. So we, we have a key, but obviously I, I want to prevent people from being able to read that key and use it, so I encrypt it using the service master key. Exactly, okay. exactly. And then the next level down from there is a service certificate. So we would generate uh, an encryption certificate in the master database, and then we would encrypt it by the database master key. Okay. Okay. Um, and then finally, in the, the database itself that we're looking to encrypt, we would create this database encryption key, which was encrypted by the certificate uh, that is stored within the master database. Okay, and then presumably I can use that database encryption key to encrypt the data in the database, I'm encrypting the data pages. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Well, why don't you, it's, it's easy to walk through it like that, but perhaps easier even still to, to yeah, see it being demonstrated. I think so let's have a look at it. It, it may help to, um, to, to have it sink in. So first of all, uh, I'll make sure we're in the context of master. So I have a database called uh, AdventureWorks Data Warehouse, just the usual sample database. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to run a backup there uh, with compression, just because um, it's something that I want to talk about at the end. Okay. So we're going to create a master key for the instance if it's not been created already. So let's have a look. So we already have a master key um, in the database, so that's fine. Okay. So now I'm going to, just in case um, I've run this demo before, I'll drop any certificate so we don't have one. So I'm going to create a certificate called TD Cert um, and give it a subject of TD Certificate just so I know what I'm going to use this certificate for. Okay. And that certificate is encrypted with the database key, is that right? Yes, okay. yes, that's correct. So now I'm going to create an encryption key, so this is the bottom level. So let's just um, drop any keys that are already there. So I'm going to create a database key. Um, I'm going to use um, AES-256, so it's a really secure encryption algorithm. Okay. And I'm going to use the server certificate that I've created um, in order to um, secure this, this encryption. Okay. Okay. So I've got a warning there about um, the database encryption key not being backed up. So we want to make a backup of that in case we ever need to recover the database exactly. and, and unencrypt it. Exactly, and, and we'll look at that um, in, the, in the later modules. Um, so we've got a query there, so based on database encryption keys. 
we can see that the AdventureWorks data warehouse has an encryption state of one, and we can see that this is un it's unencrypted. And this is the only row that's returned by this query because I've created a database encryption key. I just haven't used it yet. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to turn encryption on, and at the same time, I'm going to run that same query. So we can see that I've turned encryption on. Uh, the database is in an encryption state of two, which means encryption in progress. Mm -hmm. And But we also have TempDB. TempDB is now encrypted. What, any ideas why that might be? Um, actually, none. So the, so the reason we encrypt TempDB is because when we're encrypting a database, um, we're always going to use SQL Server is always going to use TempDB as a, as a temporary data store for data. So there's an opportunity there for data in an encrypted database to be put into TempDB. So by default, SQL Server will encrypt TempDB um, where you have um, an encrypted database on your system. I see. So there's, there's a back door there that I wouldn't have thought of. But, but somebody obviously it goes did. To somebody <laughs> obviously did. That's good news. So if we run this query again, um, we've now both those databases are now in encrypted so, so state. So it takes a little while to encrypt, I guess, depending on the size of the database. The I mean, it was quite quick when I did that, yeah. which is why I ran them both at, both at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it does take a bit of time. So what I wanted to do here is to take a backup of the database um, without compression. So backup compression is a, is a feature that, that we had in previous versions of the product. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to take a backup of the database with compression. Okay. Uh, and we'll go and have a look at some of the size differences here. So you can see here, so I did, before we did the encryption, um, I took a backup of the database yep. and it compressed down to 40 meg. I think the database itself is 180 meg, something right like that. that. Yeah. Um, and then I enabled transparent database encryption and my backup is now 160 megabytes. So that's a full backup without encryption there? That's a full backup of a transparent database encryption database. Okay, okay. but that's without compression. Correct. But the next one is where I've done that with compression. So I'm backing up an encrypted database with backup compression. But if you look at that, the compression results there are absolutely terrible. So because the data pages are encrypted, it's not really amenable to comp compression. Compression usually relies on a lot of values exactly. being similar and, of course, being readable. So Exactly. Yeah. So the downside of enabling transparent database encryption uh, is that your backups, uh, your backup compression will be very, uh, very poor generally because um, compression relies on repeated data to be able to, to reduce the size of the file. And, of course, when it's encrypted, it's all random data, so there's very little repetition. Okay. All right. Good enough. Great stuff. Let's... Um, are you going to turn off the encryption um, yeah. and, and drop the key so we'll get it back to how it was? Yeah. And then we'll... Oh, that's um, kind of mean, yes. Yeah, that's fine. We'll okay. switch back to the slides. We'll switch back. Let's go back to the slides and finish off the module. So we talked to there about um, encrypting the database, we're encrypting the data pages, and one of the things that we kind of left as, as we finished the demo was that has an impact on backup compression. If I do a regular backup of the database, compression now is no longer as effective because the, the database is encrypted. However, there is um, another aspect to do with encryption and backup that we, we kind of need to talk about to, to complete this. Because one of the risks you might have, let's say you've got a database that isn't encrypted. Mm -hmm but you want to store your backups off-site somewhere. So you've got an unencrypted database. It's in a secure location on your own server. You're pretty comfortable that, that people aren't going to get access directly to the data files, yeah. but you're going to back up and store those backup files off-site. Now, there's a danger. Someone could get hold of your backup files, restore the backups, and therefore get access to the data. So what we probably want to do is think about encrypting the backup files even if we're not encrypting the database. Exactly, and this is where this, this feature, which is new for SQL Server 2014, 
comes in because we've seen the only way to do this without looking at third party products prior to 2014 um, was to use transparent database encryption. Um, so you actually had to encrypt the database and therefore it, its backups would contain it, encrypted data. Exactly, exactly. But the downside of that, of course, is, as we've seen, is that it doesn't compress very well at mm. all. So, so now we have this backup encryption feature. So we're going through this same process of uh, creating the database master key for master, which we've already done mm. for, for, for TDE. Um, and then we would create a certificate um, and we would encrypt the backup with the certificate. But the key point to this is the encryption is done after the compression. Right, so we're, we're going to get the benefits of being able to compress the, the data files that we're backing up because those themselves are not encrypted. They're stored securely in my exactly. my environment, but they're not encrypted. But I'm going to compress them, back them up, and then encrypt the backup. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. And it's to support scenarios that, that you mentioned before about uh, storing off-site off -site backup. So <clears throat> within our organization, our SQL Server backups are stored uh, within uh, Windows Azure blob storage. Mm -hmm. uh, we encrypt those backups because they're being transferred off-site. And we have all of the keys and certificates on premise, so we control access to those. So we are uh, we have confidence then that mm. the backups being uh, outside the organization are encrypted. And, and that cloud backup uh, scenario is becoming more common as people use Absolutely. Azure as, as commodity storage for, for backups. Absolutely. And give you that resiliency of even if you lose your own site, your backups are safe in the yeah, cloud, exactly. but you want to encrypt them. Exactly. Okay, um, well, let's see how that Shall works. Shall we have a look? Yep. Okay, so I'm already in the context of master. So uh, if we haven't done this master key, but we have based on the on, on the other demo, mm, so that's that fine. Before. So I'm going to create a new certificate, exactly the same thing that we did before with with the TDE certificate, uh, but we're going to call this one the backup certificate. Oh, we already have one there, so let's just use that. Um, I'm going to export the certificate. So we had this error message before mm. about warning your your uh, your key hasn't been backed up. So we're going to back this certificate up. And this will allow me to restore the backup, even if the entire database server goes. Exactly. I've still got the certificate that I used to encrypt. Exactly. So this is the key thing that you need to control access to this certificate and, and keep a note of how we've, so we've encrypted it by password here, just from a, a very mm. basic perspective. But you need this certificate in order to be able to restore those backups. Okay, great. So now we'll... Um, create an encrypted backup through SQL Server Management Studio. So let's do Wrenchworks Data Warehouse. Backup. So it's a requirement to back up to a new media set, so I'll just switch there. So now when I have a look at options, I've now got this encrypt backup option. Okay. And I can select the algorithm that I want, so we'll go for AES256. So I'd like to have the most secure algorithm that I possibly can. And now I've got this drop down for these certificates. And you notice we've got the TDE certificate mm -hmm. and we've got the backup certificate that, that was already created. So I'm going to use that certificate to encrypt the backup. Okay. And let's. And can you apply compression stuff to this? So we can we can apply compression indeed. So we'll we'll have a look at that. Um, Chorus data warehouse. Let's call that um, just encrypted. Mm -hmm. So we'll do it just encrypted for now. So that's gone through successfully. So now, um, so I can do it through the UI. I can also mm -hmm. do it through code. So I can do this backup uh, to disk, so with compression. <clears throat> but now I've added encryption as part of my, my clauses here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use AES256 for the algorithm and this backup certificate here. 
perfect. So that worked absolutely fine. So let's switch back to this temp folder again, and hopefully we'll see. So the encrypted backup without compression was almost the same as the TDE backup, okay. but with compression, we actually have 40 megs. So we've got the same compression that we had without encryption at all. Uh, we've now got a compressed backup that's also encrypted. So again, if you were using cloud storage, and obviously you're, you're paying for that storage by how Absolutely. much of it you use, you can compress your backup but still have it encrypted and stored uh, securely um, out, in, out in the cloud. And if someone else were to get a hold of that backup media and try to restore it into a different SQL Server environment that where they don't have the backup certificate that you've got, then what they'll find is that they can't restore it because exactly. it's encrypted. Exactly. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that. That's okay. So that's been a, a, a pretty quick romp through all the various different uh, aspects of security and mm -hmm. things you need to think about in terms of designing security. Uh, we talked about an introduction to SQL Server security and just the basic concepts of principles and securables and permissions being what lets a principle access a, a securable. We talked about the server level security. So we, we talked about um, having logins that could be either Windows logins. So in other words, they're mapped to a Windows user or a Windows group, usually a local group. Um, or we talked about SQL Server logins, which exist just within SQL Server and, and usually have a password associated with them so that people can authenticate. Uh, and then we talked about server level roles so that you can use either those fixed server roles to um, provide usually typically uh, administrative type, operational type uh, permissions that are predefined against those roles, but also um, that public role which lets you access the, the list of databases that are there on the server. And then we, we talked about database level principles and the idea that you create a database user that maps to a, a, a login. So within each individual database that, the, that someone needs to access, we need to create a user that maps to their login. And then within that database, we, we've got um, fixed database roles that have preset permissions, and we can create our own uh, user-defined roles and apply permissions to those uh, depending on the needs of the application. And then there was one other special kind of database level principle, and that was the application role. And, and typically that's used to provide elevated permissions regardless of who's currently uh, logged in, what, what the security context is for the user. Uh, then we talked about database permissions and the idea of granting permissions uh, and the idea of statement permissions like grant create table to someone that lets them perform that statement or object permissions where I'm granting select, for example, on a table uh, to a, a, a principal. So, so those two different types of permissions. And we talked about permission chains or ownership chains, the idea that if, if the objects that are dependent on one another are all owned by the same user, then only the permissions on the first of those objects is checked. Whereas if the objects are owned by different users, if there's a break in the ownership chains, there needs to be permission at each new owner uh, down that chain. And then lastly, we looked at encryption. We looked at transparent data encryption to encrypt the entire database, encrypt the data pages for that database. Uh, and we saw that that's a, a relatively straightforward way to provide encryption, um, but it does have a knock-on effect if we back up the database compression is no longer effective because the, the pages are encrypted. And so we then saw the, the option to have an unencrypted database, but to apply encryption to the backup. And that lets us uh, kind of get the best of both worlds where we have the database stored on secure media. So we're not uh, you know, exposing ourselves to any unnecessary risk there. So we've got the database on premise in a secure location, but we're backing up and encrypting the backups so that we can store that backup media uh, elsewhere and still rely on it being secured. So lots to think about there. Um, lots of areas for you to explore further in SQL Server books online and go and research before taking the exam. But these are kind of the high spots of things that you should be looking at and trying to understand that hierarchy, uh, understanding how to find effective permissions for uh, a, a, a principal that may have inherited those permissions either through membership of roles or through a, a hierarchy of of objects like a database containing a schema containing tables, those types of things, and understanding the, the what's involved in encrypting a database and encrypting a backup. Lots to think about. Hope you've enjoyed that session. Um, once you've uh, kind of got your head around some of those concepts and you're ready to move on, come back and join us for the third module where we'll look at backup and restore scenarios.